Well, I feel blessed to be here today. I hope you do too. We're going to be in the book of John chapter 20. I always get a little worried that, uh, no, I should say it the other way around. I'm always glad when I get to do the first one because I'm like, ah, no one's going to steal anything from me today. <laughs> I hit it first. Um, I'm going to be reading about Thomas. I, I heard something the uh, the other day. It made me laugh as talking about Thomas. Now, Thomas probably did a whole lot in his life, but that's the only thing he's known for is doubting. <laughs> like, man, I did all these other things, and that's all you wrote about me? Um, but really, uh, today's devotional is going to be about hope and uh, and about the reason the reason that we're here and uh, the reason that we can carry on. So let's start in the, uh, ver uh, chapter 20, verse 19. This is after Jesus has appeared to Mary Magdalene. He's, he's already been resurrected. And this is the, he appears to his apostles. So I believe this is the first time I could be incorrect here. But uh, verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw their, the Lord. So Jesus said, to, uh, said them, to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven of them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Verse 24. Now Thomas called, to, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the, and the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. So, there you have Thomas. Famous line, right? I just got, when I was reading through this, just got thinking to myself, like, how excited that, that what a moment that must have been for all of them. You know, everything they had been through, and, you know, if, if there was any doubt, there isn't any now. So Thomas misses out on that. Verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's everyone here. That's all of us. You know, I sometimes my heart gets full of doubt. Sometimes I doubt myself. Actually, a lot of the times I doubt myself. But um, there's so much going on in the world and so much, you know, fear and I just get to thinking about this and I go, uh, I'm a blessed person. Um, you know, for all the things that uh, you could say about Thomas, he still believed, <laughs> you know. But I got I, the point I, I, I'm trying to get here is that, you know, the world seems to need and sometimes we seem to think that we need 100% affirmation to believe in anything, right? But... That's not necessarily true. You get in your car without 100% confidence that you might not get into a car accident, but you get in it anyway. You know, what more do you need than the fact that Jesus came, died, and came back? What more do you need? And I don't think we need more. I think what we need to do is not be unbelieving, just believing. So let's continue reading. Verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So you think about that. There were more things done, but you know what? They didn't write about it because you don't need more. This is enough. So I hope that's a, an inspiration and uh, fills you with hope as it does me. Psalm 84 is where we're going to be. So let's read the first two verses. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Fantastic devotion. I appreciate that. I, Thomas is uh, not the <laughs> greatest apostle. That, of course, belongs to Philip. Um, you know, we all have our moments where we doubt. There's no, there's no question about it. There, there's that. That's a, that's an important element of our service, is understanding that God does exist, that His Son Jesus Christ did, did come to die. It's the Lamb to the slaughter, and He did rise again. Um, one thing that we're gonna, I'm going to weave in. So again, we didn't talk before. Well, I'm going to weave in something that stood out as you were talking today. So we're going to we're going to weave that in. Um, it's interesting. And I'll just I'll tease it. It's interesting that the um, that the apostles were telling Thomas about it. They were talking about what that meant that Jesus was there. He, they they weren't quiet about it. They they were witnessing. So we're going to weave that in. All right, Psalm 84. How many people have ever read all of the Psalms, all 150? Whether it's been um, just sort of in passing or maybe over the years, um, no one's read all of them. Okay, that's okay. Has anyone, Sister Barb has, great. Has anyone, does anyone have favorites? Is there a Psalm that's a favorite, right? We all have favorite passages. We all have favorite portions of scripture. Um, sometimes what happens in reading is it will impact you a little more during your life in that regard. It'll impact you a little bit more based on what you're going through. Um, some days we're feeling fired up for God. We're just so excited. We're on fire. We can't tell anyone enough about the things of God. Um, other days we're like, oh Lord, what, what are you doing? Like, what's up with my life, and it's depressing, and I just don't feel it today, and it's cloudy outside, and it's raining, and and it's just sort of, ugh, right? Has anyone ever felt that way? I, I hope so, because it means you're human. You're not Lieutenant Commander Data, who's an android in the 24th century, Star Trek reference for you, Brother Eric. We're human. We feel those things. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with feeling a little down. That's what the Psalms are there for. The Psalms are depressing sometimes. We looked at one last week where it was, it, it felt very broken. There was a brokenness to what these people felt as they wrote it. But what I love about the Bible, which is very real, the Bible's a real book. It, it tackles the emotions that God gave to all of us. Emotions aren't bad. There's nothing wrong with having emotions. They're God-given. But do we let emotions overtake our lives? Do we let emotionalism, good or bad, overtake our lives? We all know that new convert who was on fire for God, and where are they now? Okay, They let that overtake. They, they it, you know, Good wisdom is to, okay, we're good, let's... Let's let's be realistic. Let's maintain some of that. I love being on fire. Um, Tamara's been asked a few times uh, over the last couple months, is Pastor Philip always like this? And the answer is yes, because I'm excited about the things of God. We're excited to be here. We're excited about what we see in the Bible. We're excited about what we see um, in the last days and what's happening in the news. It's It's happening. What prophets and others sought to look into, we're seeing today, it's happening. Praise God for that. So yes, I'm sorry. Always like this because I get excited for this. But pray for your pastor because I don't like rainy days anyone any better than anyone else. And the only thing worse than rainy days are Mondays. 
according to the song. And so that's a legit thing. But when we, when we walk into the assembly of God, we should automatically be lifted up. How lovely. This is how it starts. This is how when a, a, a good song always starts with a right away, like bring them in. What is this? That's a song. Bring them in. <laughs> but what's a, what's a good hook? What's a good catch? How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. (laughs) So let's tackle this. It's only 12 verses. We'll go through it. There's a couple ebbs and flows. There's some um, interesting parts to this. But remember, this is a song. This is poetry. It's meant to be sort of in that um, sing-song voice. It's meant to be in that sort of up and down inflection, singing, happy praise. So in my notes, I right away start off because I come in hot on stuff like this. I love talking about going to church. I love talking about being in the assembly of God. Which, by the way, is another term that was stolen, right? Assemblies of God. Who loves going to church? My first question. Who loves being in the assembly of God? Who loves being amongst other people with a common goal, a common theme, a common life? When we realize that this is the house of God, it should excite us. We should long for it. So that's what this song starts off with. Now, as you read underneath in your Bible, the header, which says Psalm 84, it has something, probably somewhere in there, it says something about a a psalm of the sons of Korah. Okay, so let's study them just for a second. These sons of Korah were Levites. They're from the family of Kohath. By David's time, it seems like they were sort of the musical inspirers of the temple, of the of that type of worship. They were um, <clears throat> they were served it. They served in the musical aspect of it. We see that. I have this in my notes. You don't need to turn there if you're taking notes. It's Second Chronicles twenty. It says the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high, okay? So it seems to be that they maybe at this time were in charge of the music ministry um, of service with Israel. Korah, we know from number 16, led a rebellion of 250 community leaders against Moses during the wilderness, during the days of Exodus. God judged Korah and his leaders, so all 250 died, but the sons of Korah remain. Numbers 26 talks about that. There's a specific separation Korah and these rebels died. The sons of Korah stayed alive. So as I sort of chase this out and sort of think about it, this is a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of, I can't believe we're in the house of God. How wonderful is that? He's even going to talk about jealousy for birds who live in, in and around the area because they get to be there all the time. And so we see that. So perhaps they were just grateful for this mercy and that got passed along generation after generation where maybe they were just excited to have survived God's wrath in that. So, okay, sons of Korah. So how lovely is your tabernacle? (laughs) The psalmist is yearning for the house of God. And it starts off with poetic language. You You don't hear that too often. Uh, when's the last time someone used the word lovely, right? Oh, that's lovely, right? You almost use it sarcastically. Oh, Zion, that comment was quite lovely, right? That's that's what it seems like. It's, But really, this is meant for um, it, 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 exactly what it's supposed to mean. So the, the Greek or the Hebrew is yedhid, which means well-loved, well-loved or beloved. Okay, how lovely, how loved, how how desirous. It also, you could also put in there, how beautiful, how lovely, how dear. 
is your tabernacle. Now, as we go through this, we're going to do a little twist toward the end. Okay, and so follow along as we go through this because we're going to apply it um, a little differently. We'll see. Okay, so this is the type of language that's used in poetry. How lovely, right? Oh, a spring day. Your your hair, Sister Tamara's, is as lovely as a spring meadow or whatever. It's, I don't know. I'm in trouble for that one. So um, you use that. That, that sort of eloquy where it's more like you're, you know, how do I compare thee to a summer's day, right? Shakespeare is the king of this. He doesn't tell us how lovely they were because he couldn't. It almost feels like I can't describe how, how lovely your tabernacle is, how desirous it is for me to be there. And then he tries to describe it. He even says, my soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. What do you picture when you picture that? What do you picture with the term longing? What's, what's a good example of longing? An old friend you haven't seen in a while? Maybe a family member you haven't seen for years? Maybe a promotion at work you long for? It. Man, if I just had this job, I could, man, I could turn this place around. I could, I, you know, just, I'm longing for it. I have, I have desire for it. I'm yearning for it. All right, we all have those desires. There's nothing wrong with that. We should desire it. Again, it's all about replacement. It's all about balance. We're going to use that word a lot over the next 40 years. The B word, balance. There's nothing wrong with having the desire for those things, but all in balance and with our relationship and service to the Lord. And so what do we desire? What does our soul long for? Nobody uses that term. This is, this is language that isn't used anymore. Maybe when you were dating and you use that sort of terminology. Oh, honey, I long for you. I yearn for you. I want to seek you daily. I, I just want to find you and and I just want to be there. It's that type of almost like a, almost a love affair with being in the house of God. My beloved, my dear tabernacle. O Lord of all things, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. Now, I'm going to throw this out because I think that might be accurate. We'll see, maybe. But how many people is there getting ready? They're putting their shirt on buttoning their shirt, hopefully, and getting ready. They're like, oh, I long to be in the house of God. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> You're like, are we getting to have it this afternoon? What do you think? Like, that's probably more of the conversation. And again, that's okay. But outside of talking it over with our spouse on what we're having for lunch or figuring that out, our heart is what God is looking for. Do we have a desire to be in the house of God? Do we long for it? Do we miss it on Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Wednesdays and Thursdays? And Do we long to be in the house of God? Do we want to be there where we can be, as we're going to find out later, where the sun and shield are? Okay. So not every love is so great that it makes you long. I love sports, as you many of you know. Um, I don't long for a Rams game, right? That seems silly, inappropriate, and frankly, just disappointing. So, like, but when I long for something, like to be in the house of God, the house of God is never disappointing. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is here. His word is here. It is a protection from the outside world. But unfortunately, people come into these places with ulterior motives. I listed a few. Their primary focus is on programs, social connections, entertainment, selfish expectations, or self-improvement. How many people came in today saying, all right, the pastor's going to validate exactly what I'm doing in my life? And I'm going to fit the Bible to fit what I'm doing. 
because that's how I see things. We're here to offer worship to God. <laughs> We're not here to hang out and make a deal. We're not here to come into the house of God for a program. We're not here to be entertained. We're here to give back to God. We're here to give him the worship that he's due as the God of all, the Lord of hosts. Primary focus for so many people is on programs. Entertain me, boy. Entertain me. Make church easy for me. And I'll come back. And more importantly, bloop, bloop, I'll drop some in the offering plate. And so you see pastors and leaders sell out for that. Go on YouTube and look at how to entertain a church, how to keep them coming, how to keep the money flowing. Brethren, there are so much opportunity to bring in dozens, if not hundreds of people. But we're not going to sell out for that. Jesus had opportunity to have followers by the millions and he didn't do it. Why? Because the house of God was, was special. It was separate, sanctified, important. And so it's safe to say that the psalmist and us, hopefully we feel this way. The psalmist here loved the house of God because he loved the God of the house. That's why. So it's not the building. It's not how beautiful it is and how perfect it is and how many coyotes we can catch on the, on the property. It's not about that. We love the house of God because we love the God of the house. He's here. He's here. And so the psalmist is only in verse 3, as we're going to see, talking about a couple of birds and sort of his, not jealousy, but certainly desire to be one of these birds. Let's look at verse 3. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts. And then here we go. This is what makes this key. Is God ours or is he a thing? Is the church a thing or is it ours? He says very clearly, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God, double possessive sentence. Beautiful, beautiful. My king, my ruler who's in charge of me. Where he is, your altars, once again, Lord of hosts, Lord of all. That's where these birds have found. Now, I don't know much about sparrows or swallows, so I had to look them up. I'm no botanist. I don't know birds. I don't even know if that's a thing, but whatever. So, perhaps what I think here, maybe the psalmist saw birds, these two birds, specifically the sparrow and the swallow, that had made a nest in view of the altar itself. So, a sparrow is a small bird, a bird of small significance. Are there sparrows in the, inland, in the Inland Empire? I did not get that far in my research, so I'm not sure. A sparrow, small, a bird of small significance. There's not a country whose state bird is the sparrow. That I did look up, okay, as far as I could tell. I didn't make it to the D's on the list of countries, but sparrow, small significance. A swallow is a very restless bird. Has anyone ever seen a swallow? Did you know that you saw a swallow if you saw one? I, I don't know. We have hummingbirds in the front yard, which I think are gorgeous. I am a huge fan of hummingbirds. But what we see here are two birds, perhaps specifically chosen 
as a bird of small significance and a restless bird. So what I put together, sort of maybe by use of this, was that even the insignificant can be significant in the house of God. And for those who are restless, come to the house of God and find peace. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, are burdened, like we talked about last week, are broken, are, are shackled with things they don't want to be shackled with. Come to the house of God and I will give you rest. Take it off at the door and come on in. So the insignificant can find their place in the house of God. Thomas was a nobody. He wasn't the mayor from all indications. Maybe we don't know. He wasn't the mayor. He wasn't the governor. He wasn't the doctor. He wasn't well known. These are fishermen who stunk. They smelled like fish all day. These are tax collectors who were hated. Nobody liked tax collectors because they taxed you triple and quadruple and kept the rest, gave what they needed to to Rome and kept the rest. Nobody liked tax collectors. You owe me 20 bucks, but my taxes are four. Doesn't matter. You owe me 20. Jesus went after the insignificant to make them significant, to put them in his house and make them a ruling class. Brethren, those insignificant men, those 12 are going to be on the foundations of the city for eternity. Talk about significant. Do you know why? Because they took the leap to jump into the house of God. They took the faith. They stepped out and walked away from their families to join the house of God, to join the movement that Jesus had created. And so it's not surprising when you find this and realize how valuable it is that you use a double my. It's very precious. He simply lays hold upon his God with both hands as if resolved to never let him go. Do we do that in our service? Do we worship God with both hands? Do we latch on and hold on tight to my God, my King, my Lord? God is not a hobby and his house is not a hobby. And so this double possessive my in this verse is a clear indicator that I'm, I'm grabbing on to dear life. That the only safety in this roller coaster of life is my king and my God. Verse four. He goes from envying the birds to envying the priest. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. These are the priests. They're there. Blessed are them. Because continual action, they will still be praising you. They always praise you. They're constantly praising you. They should be. He felt that they could live a life of constant praise because of their attachment to the house of God. They, the wording here is they will still be praising you. It's continual. And then how many people have read the Psalms and noticed this little word? Okay. It's a little word detached from the verse. It's pronounced Selah. Okay. Has anyone ever seen that? Okay. There's, a, I have a study on it. It's, it's an interesting, there's a couple different views on it. Um, here's how I see it. Um, the intent of the word is to pause and reflect. Pause, reflect. Okay. It's sort of like, I'll give an example. 
it's sort of like when you're watch watch your favorite politicians and i know sean you have a list of favorites and that's okay your favorites a long list of people that you love who are in politics long list that are still alive um watch them as they're talking and they say something good they read it they write they read it correctly off the prompter what do they do they pause for feedback they pause for reaction they want those listening to really let it sink in what's been said let's relate it to plants I'm no botanist. They also, they do birds and plants. I'm no botanist, but I know that a plant, when you water it, you water it and then leave it alone. Let that water soak in. Let the water soak in and get to the roots. That's what this means. It's a pause to reflect on that statement. So he's saying, blessed are those who dwell in your house because they're constantly praising you. Brethren, that's us. That should be us. A constant state of praise. And then he says, reflect on that. It's a pause to reflect on what was said. It's accentuating it. Now we would put it in bold. Okay. Or we would highlight it in yellow. Right? We would do something like that to really make it stand out. They should, they will, they still praise you because they get to live and dwell and be in the house constantly. How wonderful is that? Verse five. Oh man, this psalm get, keeps getting better. Okay? Let's read the next verse. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Oh, yes. Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Those who are anxious to go to the house of the Lord, to take on the festivals, to be in the house, to go to the tabernacle, to be there for this. We all live in different places. But we all come together for the commonality of serving God. Some closer, some farther away. But yet we come here to worship God. If you want entertainment, there's plenty of choices. If you want big programs, there's plenty of options. If you want the word of God, we're it. If you want the Holy Spirit, we're it. Pilgrimage. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Brother, and the reason why I picked this psalm is because it does link to last week where we talked about being broken. We talked about feeling defeated, the real life emotion of defeat and depression, and brokenness, and sadness, and, and despair, and hopelessness. Hopelessness, the opposite of what Brother Paul brought out today. Those are real. Those are, those are legit. But holy, blessed, strengthened, comforted, is the man, the person, the human whose strength is in God. Brethren, it's, you, can't, you can't describe what it feels like you can try. Brethren, when you're broken, there's only one way to turn. When you're not feeling it, there's only one way to turn. There's only one place who can help unbreak you. Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. They realize in this hope, they realize that this world isn't everything. That we're just pilgrims. We're the wayfaring stranger. Our daughter talks about that song all the time. It's stuck with her. We're just wayfaring strangers. We're just, we're, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. If we have our mind on the things of this earth, then we will be disappointed. 
If we put our focus on attaining the things of this world, we will be let down. Why do you think there is so much fear and depression and sadness and hopelessness in the world? Because they're not looking up. They're looking sideways or down. People need to look up. So blessed is the man whose strength, O Lord of hosts, which he said twice, my king, my God. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. They're journeying toward the end. Every journey has a destination. When you left today, you knew where you were coming. When you leave here, you will head to your homes. That will be your destination. Every journey of every person whose strength is in God wants to end up in Zion. Why? Because that is the epitome of God's glory, as we're going to see later. Now, this Valley of Baca, which is not Klingon, Valley of Baca is uh, sort of a deserty place, not really a whole lot known about it, but it also has the idea of weeping. So picture that. Baca is the valleys that we go through. This present world to us should be a valley of weeping. He's already talked about longing. He's already talked about where we're finding our strength. And so in our passage through, we are refreshed by the streams of divine grace and of this great, from this great fountain of consolation. Where do we find this? Brethren, it's not in the world. It's not in the world. For those who are not attached to the, to the tabernacle, to the house of God, this is where it's at. Anything outside of that is attached to something else, which is perishing. And so our valleys and our lives, we go through weeping, we go through sadness, we go through tears, we go through depression, we go through brokenness. It happens. It's real. But brethren, on this journey, we are refreshed and go from strength to strength. Now, that's hard to do on a journey when we have traveled and we've been on a plane for 24 hours, not on a plane, but away from home, it takes 24 hours to get somewhere. We're tired. We're fired up. Yeah, look at where we're going. But at the end, we're like, oh, what we want to do is just, like sleeping in the Dallas airport is not as much fun as it sounds. And so, the thought of traveling and and going through valleys of tears and weeping and actually calling it strength to strength instead of strength to weakness, strength to fatigue. What does that tell you? Those who pass through this blessed man whose heart is on pilgrimage, who so focused on the things of God, that as they go through these horrible times in their lives, they actually go from strength to strength because God doesn't get tired. We may get tired. We do get tired. But when we look at verse 7, it's to appear before God in Zion. That's our goal. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we want. So then he says, Oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. I thought this was a song. I thought it was supposed to be happy. He's resetting with God. Oh Lord God of hosts. Third time. He has used that term. 
hear my prayer. Give me strength to strength. In verse five, he talks about blessed is the man whose strength is in you. In verse seven, he says they go from strength to strength. Needing strength implies there's weakness. Needing strength implies that there are things that will bring us down, that we won't feel strong. So we have, as we read this, it's so easy. And brethren, I've done it. Oh my goodness, I've done it. You read it and you're just like, all right, I read Psalm 84 today. I'm good. I'm holy. Look at me. I'm a reader. <laughs> I read Psalm 84 today. But what does it say? What does it mean? But I read it. Brother, and that's the start. That's where it begins. Overcoming to read is fantastic. But if there's a strength, that means there's a weakness. If people are in need of strength, that means that they're conditioned for weakness. And in the world, there is weakness. The world is wearing down. The world is coming to an end. And so he's begging God, O oh Lord God of hosts, I'm begging you, hear me. O oh, ear, or give ear, O God of Jacob. And then let's pause and think about that. Let's pause and reflect on the intensity in which I'm praying for this. I want this house of God. And I'm praying, God, remember your covenant with Jacob. Remember us. Bring us back. Give us strength. And then he's going to use an example. Let's talk about the example. I love this. Oh, this is good stuff. Verse 9. Oh God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. I mean, he's asking God, don't forget us. God doesn't forget his people, but I want to tell you something that does happen. God's people forget God. God's people sometimes feel a little invincible and they get influenced by the world and think they can do this on their own. It's happened to all of us. Very, very real. It's happened to all of us. It doesn't make it right. It means it's happened. He's asking for God to be the shield, to deflect, to go to war for us. We're going to see that again in verse 11. But he's saying, behold our shield. Look upon the face of your anointed. Be there. Find us. Look at us eye to eye, God to people. That's relationship, brother, and that's what that is. That's relationship with God. Verse 10. I love this. Oh, this is so good. For a day in your courts, a day in your presence. Here's your twist. You ready for the twist? It's not about the building. It's about where God is. Where is God's presence? It's not about the four walls, however many walls there are. It's not about the building. It's not about the luxuries of the building. He's saying that a day in your courts, like being in the tabernacle, being in that presence, yes, being there, but it's in your presence. He says, is better than a thousand I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. What does that tell you? The psalmist found something. He found it. And he treated it as the jewel that it is. I'd rather spend a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. We should have that desire. We should want to be in the presence of God. Do you know where God's presence is? It's in his New Testament church. Do you know where it is also? It's in his word. 
So how can we, well, I love God. Great. Action. What are we doing? The action here is I'd rather spend a day with you in your courts, in your presence, around you, than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather be the first guy who shows up and the last guy who leaves as a doorkeeper in the house of my God. He goes back to that. In the house of my God. Relationship. Look upon us. Look at us face to face. You're anointed. You're holy. You're separate. You're sanctified. Look at us. And for you, you are my God. And I would take a day in your house over a thousand days of dwelling with the wicked. Do we have that mentality? It's not just the building on Etiwanda, <laughs> West Etiwanda. It's where God dwells. This is a huge, huge, huge theme throughout the Bible is being in the presence of God. So he says it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. I'd rather come early, stay late, than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Thankful for all of you, because I know we have this mentality. Or we wouldn't be here. We've overcome today to be here. We've overcome the challenges and distractions. We've looked at the tents of the wicked and thought, not today, Satan. We've overcome today. But brethren, these doors aren't open tomorrow. So what are we going to do tomorrow? Is it a relationship or is it a thing? Only you know that. Only I know that. We have to treat it as relationship with God, in the presence of God. Because he says, in this relationship, Lord, you are a sun and a shield. You will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Brethren, you can't just walk uprightly from 1030 to 1, 1030 to noon, then again from 130 to Usually it's 3, 3.30, from 7 to 7.55 on Wednesday nights. You can't walk uprightly just in those times. So what is he saying? Where is the upright walking around those times? Are we seeking the presence of God through prayer, through his word? <laughs> He's talking about going through a valley of tears, so it's not easy. It's not easy. But then God is willing to open the floodgates on good things. He just has to withhold it because it's determinant on us. Are we willing to worship God to receive the good things that God wants to give us? He says very clearly, brethren, it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus said that to his apostles. He said it to them out loud. It is my good pleasure. Little flock, not huge masses, not mega churches, not millions and millions. Little flock. It is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So the psalmist says the same thing. No good thing will be up. Start over. No good thing. Will he withhold? My friends, he wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. He wants to bring to him those who are faithful. He's giving us every opportunity. But we have to choose to walk uprightly. In that time, he will be our son and our shield. And it was what the psalmist here is looking for. He's looking for that. 
but instead we waste time on other things. We waste so much time, so much time on other things. We do. This is coming to me too. I waste my time on a lot of stuff. Sister Barb, confession is good for the soul, but I waste my time on a lot of stuff. Stuff, rabbit holes that I've confessed before, I don't need to be chasing, just dumb things. But brethren, that's not going to count in the end. None of that. How, how much you cared about the 2024 election and how much you knew about it. The Lord's not going to care. He's going to call that wood, hay, and stubble. He's going to call that stuff you didn't do for me. That's under that. That's just going to burn. And so he's asking. He's telling us. I'd rather spend, verse back to verse 10, a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be there. I want to be in the presence of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. We see this in Philippians 3.8. Just for your notes, I have it printed. Time spent in God's house is far better and more valuable than time spent anywhere else. It just is. It just is. So in Philippians 3, Paul says, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss, rubbish, trash, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. What do we do when we want to learn something? School, work, putting a shelf together. We dive into it. We delve into it. Brother Armando is a jack of all trades. He knows a lot of different things. I'm, I'll say it, I'm envious of a lot of stuff that Brother Armando knows. He knows a lot of stuff. But it, maybe we can hear, you didn't, it didn't just happen. You had to learn it. You had to pick it up. You had to immerse yourself in it. You had to focus on it. You had to delve into it. You had to learn it. And so Paul is saying that instead of wasting time on other stuff, I count all that stuff as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Go back to when you were first dating. You didn't know that person. It took time. It took effort. It took listening. Guys, I'm talking to you. It took listening to listen and to pay attention. That's how we learn of the excellence of Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have to know. We have to want to know. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things. Paul suffered a lot. But he says, I count it all trash that I may win Christ. Paul's no different than we are. Paul's no different. He just had a different perspective. There's your difference. Those who want to walk uprightly have a different perspective. They're not coming to church week after week, week after week to put in their time. They're finding, seeking, and discovering relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. And they're doing it outside of these walls. That walking uprightly is just is not just coming to church. It's a walk. Psalm 73. I almost chose this one for today. Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none on the earth that I desire besides you. What do we desire? We can live that life. We can look into the tents of the wicked. We could be jealous and envious of what the wicked have, or we could be content, happy, and satisfied in the house of God, (laughs) which is where God is. Have I mentioned that? Verse 12, close it out. The 
O Lord of hosts. Where does that sound familiar? I think we've seen it all throughout this song. Okay? He's putting God where he belongs, at the top. Lord of hosts, the alive God, the creator God, not the false gods that were all around us, not the false gods that we walked through. O Lord of hosts, the creator God, the king God, the God over all. <laughs> and he just lays it out. In verse five, he says, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is not content with the things of the world, but views this as a pilgrimage, a journey to an end through this life. They're putting their strength in you. The, the man who is blessed is the one putting their strength in you. O Lord of hosts, verse 12, blessed, separate, sanctified, holy is the man, the human, adult or child, person, who trusts in you? There's something to this, guys. This isn't here just for our entertainment. This is here because the blessings that God is having to hold back will be there for those who trust in him. So important. Do we want the Lord to bless us? I do. Because... Ask yourself, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? We could not believe. That's fine. We could stop attending church. Fine. Stop reading our Bible. Fine. Stop praying. I knew there was one more. Stop praying. Fine. And there have been very successful people who have done that. Successful in the things of the world. It doesn't appear to me that CEOs and many of them don't seem to have a faith. They seem to have faith in themselves, whether you own Twitter or own a software company or own a delivery company with warehouses all over the Inland Empire that will bring it to you the next day in the prime time of your life. Those people don't seem to have a faith in God. Their faith is in themselves. And that's okay. That's okay. We're not going to be asked why we didn't email Elon and ask him about his faith. Brother, we're going to be responsible for us. Us. We're going to be responsible for us. And so we can apply this to the faithful, but brother, and this is about us. This is about individually. I wish Tamara could help me as I'm standing before the Lord, but she's not going to be there. It's going to be me and God. Because when it comes to negotiating a lower price, like on a dishwasher, I want Sister Tamara on my side. But that's not how it works in the end. It's me and God. And you know what he's going to ask? He's going to ask, what did you do for me? What did you do for me? Because as you can see, I'm in charge here. I just sent my son back. And you weren't ready. So at the end of the day, it's me and my son, and we're about to rule this thing for eternity. So what did you do for me? When you had free will, when you had choice to do what you wanted to do, what did you do for me? Is it going to be gold, silver, and precious stones because we did things for him? Or is it going to burn? When we worship in the house of God, it won't burn. When we worship in the house of God, that's where we need to be. Brother, I, I just want us all to be there. Now, what does there mean? I've already gotten a vote to keep going through Revelation. Fine, maybe we do. Because in order to want it, we have to picture it. In order to want it, we have to know it. And in order to overcome the trash, the rubbish, the garbage, the distractions, the, the tents of the wicked, if 
if we're going to put that aside for the sake of this book and my service and coming to church and witnessing to people and praying through the week and overcoming by reading and by having God's name on the tip of our tongue every time, if that's what we want, then we've got a picture of what we get for doing that. That's why he mentions, we're all coming to Zion because that's the epitome of God's glory. And so my prayer every day for all of you is that we just keep going. There are distractions plenty. There are alternatives plenty. There are programs and way better looking and more articulate pastors. I get that. That's fine. Who tickle your ears and tell you how great you are, but I murdered a guy. You're fine. They just want to keep the crowds. Brethren, we're never going to put sell out. As long as I'm here, we're never going to sell out our birthright for a bowl of beans. Because it's not worth it. Those beans went in Sorry to be graphic, came out and that birthright was gone. And we may have hundreds sitting here and, you know, a religious Van Halen up here doing their thing and whatever else and millions in the plate. But at what cost? The house of God is the house of God, not the house for us as a status. It's the house of God. So when we come here, we check it at the door and we come in and we say, praise God that I'm here. How are you today? (laughs) And let's talk about the victories. Let's talk about the distractions. Let's talk about what gets us. Let's talk about what successes we had. Let's talk about the things that bind us closer together. Because it's us against them. And that's how Jesus wanted it. That's how he viewed it. They will hate you. They will revile you. They will despise you. They will come after you. They will persecute you. They, they, they. That tells me there's a separation. And that tells me that he honed together a group to push through the valley of tears. And so that's what our call is today. Our call is to push through the valley of tears and distraction and garbage and rubbish and trash and stuff and to just keep moving, keep pushing because brethren, we're all gonna stand before him and we have to account for the years maybe decades that we wasted on not serving him. And you're not going to sweet talk him. You're, 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 you're not going to, I hate this term, you're not, you're not going to blow smoke. He sees your heart and he knows what's legit for us. And brother, and I wouldn't have it any other way because any other God doesn't matter. Any other God that I can play with Or altar like my own isn't a God I want to serve. That's a God serving me. And that's not the God we worship. So as we stand this morning, I guess the prayer is that we enjoy these psalms. These psalms have so much meat to them. They're not just, you know, psalms, pretty songs. There's meat to these things. I want us to discover that. We may go through another one next week. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. We'll find out. (laughs) We'll probably find out when I do. But let's read these Psalms. Let's dig into the word. And brother, and I pray for all of us that when it's just him and us now and in the future, that we do what he wants us to do. Those who live uprightly will be blessed. What are we going to sing this morning?